me, the rock is sit on what they call saddle rock. Well, they took one side of the saddle right out to the north side of the saddle. But they worked oh, weekends, day in, day out, nights, and everything else on it. They bum, borrowed, stole <laughs> to get that. And when we went up there, when I got started on it, we'd been laid off. I knew what it was. I already had the blueprints. Bob Bill gave me the blueprints for the rebar. I knew where the re what the rebar was going to be. So I recruited, well, Bill Bart, who was more or less, he ran the whole job. He was a superintendent of construction for the Anaconda Company. He more or less ran the whole job. But him and Reno Isaacson, who was a miner, one of the best there was, Joe Lake run the crane, Royce Goog was a pipe fitter, and I'm the iron worker. And we had all the rod rods were donated by the Anaconda Company, by Arco. There was a rod plant down at, on the, down, down there where the Arco offices are, they were, or MRI's offices are. Right in the back was the rod plant, which I ran that before the, we got shut off. We had bundles and bundles of half inch and three quarter inch rebar. So they went down and put the bum on the Arco. MRI, who at that time was uh, Frank Gardner was the man in charge and he agreed to let us have the rebar so we went down with the low boy and Joe Robertson's low boy and the Grove and we picked up the bundles and we brought them all up to the Duke Mines machine shop. They had a regular bender there. They bend rails with it, they bend iron with it and everything else and we figured it out on the ground. We <laughs> laid out the contour on the ground. And we did you ever see electrician shaky bars? No. To bend conduit pipe? Oh yeah. Okay. We drew the segment that we needed, a forty foot segment is what we needed. And we drew it we made, we got a piece of half inch rebar and we hickey bars and we bent it to that trough line. Then we set the machine to do the bending. And you had to feed it in and rather had to take it out as it come around. And then we wasted maybe three or four till we got it right. Because you had to change, get it right. Okay, we got it right. Then she was Katie Bardenor. Bend, bend, bend all day long. Take them over, put them in bundles. What part of the blueprint they went in? The shorter you got the inside, got a tighter bend, close in here was a tight bend. Outside here was a full bend, see? Long bend. It took us maybe three weeks to fabricate all this rebar. In the meantime, down in the yard down there at the Joe Roberts was Bill Earl Casagranda and oh there were three or four other carpenters and him, Bobo Bobo Bill, they were still working. They were working for MRI then. But then we could, like I say, we got all this rebar and we bundled it and tagged it and I went and got the basic colors of paint, spray paint. Rebar is coated with, from the black. You put a black mark, then you put red, green, blue, that's the numbers. From zero, from one to, to ten, which is zero, the colors. Silver, gold, red, all the colors. But you start with black. All right, say you want 261. Two is red. Six is blue. Green is, uh, one is yellow, okay. But the start of the rod was black, painted. Then you got the color code and you got the number of the three bars. Where you go, red, blue, white. That's the number of the rod. So you mark all the num numbers of that number. Oh, I see. Yeah. Then you bundle all that together. Then you know that the bottom ring or the top ring it each takes. But that's what they call color code. If you get rebar fabricated in a factory that comes into the Butte, Montana. We had our own rebar plant. We had our own batch plant. We had on the hill. We had a rod plant. We had a cement plant. And we had all this material. Now Bob Lynch, the guy that you interviewed, he ran the rod plant. He did all the fabricating of the rods for the Kelly shaft with another iron worker, boiler makers, but he ran it. 
And anyway, we used the same system with coating and everything. Then when we got it all bent, we took it down to Joe Roberts' yard. Then we set it up like inside the ring. <clears throat> we set up both, top and bottom, checked all the codes, made sure every rod fit in its place, and then we started with the outside rods. We start on the inside, see. So you start with the inside rods when you go to time. So that was a that was a bundle by itself, and as you come out, you got the longer rods as you come out. And that's the way it was all fabricated up in that yard up there. Then when it come time to go, we started hauling it all up on the mountain. We had all the rods scattered around the outside of these, after the base was in. All the rebar was scattered around here in conjunction with where it goes in here. Now, we don't have a place to eat. We're eating outside, out in the open air. So after the statue was finished, or I mean the base was poured, we knew we were going to be up there for a long, long time. So, there's a just sec, John. Okay, now turn it's got a little bit of a glint on it. Okay, that was a stockpile of what sand. Or the sand was there, and the gravel was alongside of it. Yeah. Okay, the crane would pick up. A cement bucket, they had it exactly weighted, a cement bucket full of sand and pour it in the hopper, a cement bucket full of gravel and pour it in the hopper. Then they put the cement bucket down and 16 guys carried the sacks up to the cement bucket. They had one cutter, one guy with a knife and he slashed them and they dumped them in. As Soon as you got rid of that one sack, you went and got another one because it took 32 sacks. So everybody, 35 sack mix, it took, everybody had to go back twice and three guys had to go back for the third, each one had to get one more, we made 35 sacks. But that was all football players from Montana Tech, the cops, <laughs> we had everybody, we had everybody doing that. <laughs> oh yeah, you couldn't believe it. Their forms are contoured to make the circle, you know, to make the ring. Okay. Okay. We don't have a place to eat now. This is all poor. We don't have a place to eat, so they're trying to figure out a shack. See this fella here? That's Earl Casagrande. That's there's Leroy, Earl, Henry Ritz. But this, there's Scoog. There's Bill Barth. But anyway, we don't have no love. <laughs> you gotta see it to believe. There's the chopper. they made a house out of them. See the walls? If you see the contour of the house, that's the gingerbread house right there. That was made from the forms? Yeah. Hold that up again, John. See the contour of the building? Oh, <laughs> I see. Shaped like the forms. And so what they make, what they use that house for? That's where we ate. That was home. Oh, okay. We had a stove in there and everything. But anyway, I brought up a garage from <coughs> down the garage from the house in the boulevard. All right, down on South Montana Street. They had it on a trailer. They were coming up the switchbacks on the up. They'd already went down across the valley and were coming up, and the ball on the trailer broke. <laughs> down the hill went the garage, the trailer, and the whole works. The only thing left was the roof in one piece. So that's where they got the idea. Earl said, well, let's use the forms. So they went and got a couple of big beams, 
wooden beams and put them down and made their outline of the building and then they built the gingerbread house on top of it. Bart said, well, you know where that roof is at, John? I said, yeah, he said, take the grove and go down there and take a couple of guys, which he said, rig that and bring it back up. So we went down over the mountain, <laughs> boomed out, got the roof and brought it up. They fixed it, put it on, that's the top of the, the roof from the garage in the boulevard is on top of the forms on the Lady of the Rockies. That was home. That's where we had. Now it's moved, it's down in the valley, down below the Lady of the Rockies. It's still there. It's used for, it's still got all our rigging and everything else is still in it. That's where we keep our rigging. But <laughs> the gingerbread house. <laughs> December? Uh -huh. And July. You get the moon over her shoulder. Right over her shoulder, doesn't it? Yeah. December the 20th, 1985. Pinned with all the cars all the way back, reporters, that's what everybody. If you were to strip away the the sheathing on that structure, how is it similar to a head frame? Five floors of iron. Five floors of structural iron right up to her head, right to there. Okay. All laced in. You know, you can, you got it, age everybody's got, she's the blessed mother, she's the mother of our Lord. To me, she is, just, well, I'll just have to look back to 1996 when I was operated on for lung cancer. And the prayers that were offered up to her by me, by the, all the people from the Lady of the Rockies, from the prayer lines to her and her son, and I came out of it real well. To this day, I've yet to go on that mountain that I don't go out in front and sit there and talk to the boss for a while. Not only me, but everybody that worked on that mountain goes out and talks to her at one time or another. They tell her their troubles. They tell her their good things. But you'll always find somebody missing and they're out with the lady. To me, I don't know. She's just... The best. She just is right. Okay. Slowly around. We just got laid off two years before. Two years before. I always said, everybody said, she just looked around and said, well, this town needs help. We never had a McDonald's, we never had a Kmart, we never had this, we never had that. She was up on that mountain on the 20th of December and the 16th of January of 86, Washington bought the pit and rehired 300 men, and Butte's been going up ever since, because that lady knew that we needed help.